Hello, my name is Colin Selleck and I am a mechanical engineer. Uh, thank you for having me speak with you today about this very important issue of ethics and engineering. We all know what engineering is. Let's start with a good solid definition of ethics, which you may or may not have studied in your career. Historically, there have been many different approaches to ethics, also known as moral philosophy. And each culture has evolved its own distinct moral tradition. But what they all share is a concern for the conduct of the individual relative to the society to which they belong and the conduct of the society relative to all the individuals it comprises. It's a reciprocal situation. The individual has responsibilities to the tribe and the tribe has responsibilities to the individual. Ethics is a codification or an arrangement of laws into a systematic code of the ongoing dialogue between these two parties, the whole and its parts, the society and the individual. Now, philosophers have spent entire careers studying this field along with other seemingly mysterious and obscure subjects. They like to investigate such topics, but why do we as scientists, engineers, need to think about such seemingly abstruse philosophical matters. This is the crucial question. What does ethics have to do with engineering? Okay, in short, we make things that can hurt people. We design things, often very large things, that have the potential to cause catastrophic damage to large numbers of people. Fortunately, our field has evolved in such a way that we now have formal codes of ethics, each field of engineering having its own specific set. But before the 20th century, there were no such established codes. It took a slew of catastrophic structural failures, notably the Ashtabula River Railroad disaster in 1876 and the Quebec Bridge collapse in 1907, to force the issue. The Ashtabula disaster was a derailment caused by the failure of a bridge over the Ashtabula River in far northeastern Ohio. Two locomotives hauling 11 rail cars carrying 159 passengers plunged into the river in deep snow when the bridge gave way beneath them. The accident killed 92 people. The coroner's report found that the bridge, designed by the railroad company president, of all things, had been improperly designed and inadequately inspected. The Quebec bridge disaster occurred uh, while the bridge was still in construction. Uh, by 1904, the southern half of the structure was taking shape. However, preliminary calculations made early in the planning stages were never properly checked when the design was finalized and the actual weight of the bridge was far in excess of its carrying capacity. All went well until the bridge was nearing completion in the summer of 1907 when the site engineering team began noticing increasing distortions of key structural members already in place. The engineering team became increasingly concerned and wrote repeatedly to the main office of the Phoenix Bridge Company who at first replied that the problems were minor. They claimed that the beams must already have been bent before they were installed, but it soon became clear to the engineering team that this was wrong. A more experienced engineering team might have telegraphed the home office, but instead they sent a letter, followed by a visit to New York to meet on August 29, 1907. The Home Office finally agreed that the issue was serious and promptly telegraphed the construction site, add no more load to bridge till after due consideration of facts. However, near quitting time that same afternoon, after four years of construction, the south arm and part of the central section of the bridge collapsed into the St. Lawrence River in just 15 seconds. Of the 86 workers on the bridge that day, 75 were killed and the rest were injured, making it the world's worst bridge construction disaster at that time. 
Now, in my field of mechanical engineering, our professional organization, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, has published a code of ethics which begins with three fundamental principles. Engineers uphold and advance their integrity, honor, and dignity of the engineering profession by using their knowledge and skill for the enhancement of human welfare. It makes sense to help your neighbor. Humans are communal at heart. Being honest and impartial and serving with fidelity their clients, including their employers and the public. Being sympathetic to the arguments of both sides leads to wise decisions. And three, striving to increase the competence and prestige of the engineering profession. It is the camaraderie of like-minded individuals that leads to success. These three principles are further developed in the code itself. Ethic, engineers shall act in professional matters for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees and shall avoid conflicts of interest or the appearance of conflicts of interest. As an example, let's say you're working for an HVAC company in the city, uh, in New York City, that is, uh, you're designing the heating and cooling systems of electronic control systems for a large skyscraper. Maybe a vendor, a carrier, train, they may try to endear you to their company by offering free concert tickets, free dinners, or, or even a ski vacation. It is unethical to accept such gifts. You may tell yourself, well, I've already chosen my vendor, or I will not let this influence my decision, so there's no conflict of interest. But what if the local paper were to write a story about this? It would certainly have the appearance of conflict of interest. Hence, it is unethical. Where to draw the line? It's okay to accept coffee mugs emblazoned with the vendor's logo, but not much more. But even with these codes, ethical dilemmas persist. Because as I intend to demonstrate in what follows, real life has a way of defying simplicity. Your grandmother's injunction to do unto others as you would have them do unto you just doesn't cut it all the time. As it happens, most ethical matters involve conflicts of interest that have to be evaluated with great nuance. Today, I'm gonna to show you a case study of the space shuttle Challenger disaster in which suspect ethical behavior did in fact lead to disaster. And we'll ask ourselves what could have been done differently by each of the parties involved. Then I'll end with an example of a contemporary issue that engineers are now grappling with, uh, with the hope that some of you might be in a position to help resolve it. And that issue is self-driving cars. The first case study is that of the space shuttle Challenger disaster on January 28th, 1986. Uh, since a lot of students at least weren't born at that time, I, I wanna show a video of that launch on that fateful day. Uh, this is one of those events that occurs in lives where everyone remembers where they were and what they were doing when they first heard the news. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engine 
Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. Controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Contingency procedures are in effect. Uh, Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a, a point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. We are awaiting uh, verification from uh, uh, as to the location of the recovery forces in the field to, to see what uh, may be possible at this point. Now let's look at the cause of the explosion. Uh, here is an exploded view of the segmented solid rocket booster, or SRB. Uh, there were two of these strapped to either side of the liquid fuel tank containing the hydrogen and oxygen needed during launch for the space shuttle's three main engines. The SRBs were built by NASA subcontractor Morton Thiokol based in Utah. And as you can see, like right here, um, the SRBs consisted of a number of cylindrical shells joined together. Each of these joints between the cylinders, they were called field joints, had to be sealed to prevent hot gases from ex escaping. So here's the, the uh, 
the field drawing. Let's take a closer look at the design. They consisted of a tang, this vertical piece, and a clevis connected by 177 clevis pens uh, around the circumference of the SRB. Uh, up here, you can see the sealing mechanism. It consisted of zinc chromate putty and two O-rings. Uh, this right side over here is inside the booster, so it's high pressure. That high pressure would push against the side of the clevis and seal the O-rings. The putty was supposed to prevent the, uh, the O-rings from corroding, but it often failed. A problem with this design is something which is known as joint rotation, and you can see that over here on the right. This is an exaggerated view of the phenomenon. But as you can see, external stresses could cause the tang to pull away from the O-rings, thus breaking the seal. Must keep in mind that there's a lot of vibration going on and these uh, cylindrical shells are just held together by this joint right here. So there is possibility for motion in the upper cylinder here relative to the pen, to the clevis rather. Let's look at the facts leading up to the launch. On a previous flight in 1985, which occurred in 53 degree weather, Roger Boisgelet, lead engineer on the SRB, discovered black soot on the outside of the SRB, indicating that hot gases had blown by the O-rings. Roger sent a letter to NASA about this problem, but that ended up in a drawer somewhere. Uh, NASA was under huge political pressure at the time as Congress was unhappy with NASA because of delays and shuttle performance. NASA had built the shuttle as a reliable, inexpensive launch vehicle with quick turnarounds and would be competitively priced with more traditional non-reusable rockets. It was to be used to launch commercial and military satellites and so was crucial to the well-being and security of the United States. Now, as it turns out, the shuttle was very expensive. The cost was $8,000 per pound of payload versus $2,300 per pound for a rocket. The original estimate was $53 per pound. That's a factor of 150 times less than it actually was. Including engineering, the cost was $1.5 billion, with a B, per launch, which comes to $27,000 per pound. This shows serious problems with the conceptual design of the shuttle. And just to give you an idea about the disconnect between the vision and the reality, here's an artist rendition of the expected resupply scenario. Looks like they thought we'll tow the shuttle into a hangar, empty the garbage, stock the pantry with food and water, stow a couple of more satellites in the payload bay, give it a tow to the launch pad, and launch, right? Well, Here's an actual photo of the resupply. Need I say more? You can barely see the shuttle. Uh, the tip of the shuttle the, is right here. A picture does indeed speak a thousand words. Now, don't get me wrong, I love NASA. In my youth, I fervently followed the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. I watched live on TV as Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And this fascination continues today. Rovers on Mars, exploratory instruments examining asteroids in the nether regions of our solar system, and marvelous space telescopes revealing the secrets of the universe. Impressive stuff. But the conceptual design of manned spaceflight suffered greatly in my view. And moving on now, here are the pressures that NASA was up against in those days. NASA was facing competition from the European Space Agency that was developing a low-cost alternative to the shuttle and could put the shuttle out of business. Krista McAuliffe, a high school teacher from New Hampshire, was scheduled to be on board the Challenger as part of NASA's Teacher in Space program, which was spearheaded by then-president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Reagan was scheduled to give a State of the Union address very soon, and NASA wanted to exploit that for PR purposes. Plus, the launch had already been scrubbed twice due to weather and equipment failure. In the days leading up to the launch, a cold front was approaching, bringing very cold weather to the launch site. 
temperature at launch time was expected to be 20 degrees. Given these low temperatures, NASA checked with all these shuttle contractors to determine if there were any problems launching in cold weather. A teleconference was set up between NASA and Morton Thiokol. Roger Boisgelet gave an hour-long presentation on how the cold weather would increase the problems of joint rotation and the sealing of the O-rings. Then the Vice President for Engineering at Morton Thiokol presented his recommendation that the launch be scrubbed, reasoning that since there had been O-ring erosion at 53 degrees a year earlier, launching at 20 degrees would be dangerous since there was no data at that temperature. Others from NASA disagree with Roger, pointing out that the data were inconclusive and the discussion was taken offline for a few minutes. After much discussion, a senior executive with Morton Thiokol turned to the VP of engineering and said these now infamous words, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. The VP reversed his decision and recommended that the launch proceed. Let's move on to the actual launch on that fateful day in 1986. The overnight temperature was eight degrees, much colder than expected. Estimates placed the temperature at the field joints at launch at 28 degrees. Uh, at launch, Roger Beaujolais was extremely anxious. He, he could barely bring himself to watch the launch. He was convinced that the SRB would fail at ignition, but it didn't. Once the shuttle cleared the tower, Roger leaned over to a colleague and whispered, we dodged a bullet. After a minute, his colleague whispered back, I just finished a prayer, thanks. And as we know now, 13 seconds later, boom. Let's examine some photographs of the accident in closer detail. At liftoff, the O-rings did disintegrate, just as Roger suspected, in a puff of oily black smoke that you can see here. It was later that uh, discovered that the gas blow-by had occurred over 70 degrees of the arc around the fuel joint. Luckily, glassy oxides resulting from byproducts of the combustion process filled the gap and sealed the fuel joint. But one minute into the flight, Challenger underwent one of the highest wind shears ever recorded on a shuttle flight. The resulting stresses caused the joint to rotate and shattered the glassy oxides that had formed in the field joint, allowing hot gas to spew from the joint. Uh, here you can see a jet of high temperature gas uh, escaping the SRB joint. The jet strikes the fuel tank loaded with hydrogen and oxygen, resulting in the explosion. The shuttle was traveling at 2,900 feet per second, just under 2,000 miles per hour, or about half a mile per second, at an altitude of 55,000 feet. Here you can see the crew cabin. It was a self-contained pressure vessel, which seemingly survived the explosion intact. 25 seconds after the explosion, it reached its peak altitude of 65,000 feet. That's over 12 miles. Two minutes and 20 seconds later, it struck the ocean. Three of the four recovered air packs showed activation and oxygen use consistent with time to impact. The only hope is that the crew cabin was breached and that the astronauts were not conscious during the fall to Earth. There is no crew cabin audio during the descent. But the ethical failures in this case were still to come. President Reagan appointed William Rogers to head a presidential commission to investigate the accident. It became known as the Rogers Commission. Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, professor of physics at California Institute of Technology was asked to be on the commission. I've come across some interesting video that shows Feynman explaining what thoughts were going through his head when he received the invitation. He said, quote, I have a policy of never going near Washington. They're a bunch of clowns in my view. I call up various friends of mine who were connected to the space program and asked them if I should go or could someone else do it just as well. And they both told me, no, you don't wanna do it. I was still trying to get out of it, but then my wife started in on me. She said, 
You are the only one with the knowledge and perseverance to find out what happened and the courage and conviction to stand up and tell the truth. And I knew she was right and that I had no further excuse because I could make a contribution that nobody else could make, end quote. Now remember, uh, NASA had contractors all over the country working on the shuttle, and the commission was to visit them all. However, the commission was led by the nose from place to place and shown bits and pieces in carefully scripted meetings. The commission members were not allowed free access to facilities and individuals, which is absurd as that will stymie any investigation. It became clear to Feynman that a whitewash was going on. So at his own expense, he traveled all over the country asking questions and poking his nose into the nooks and crannies. And he found the answer. In a now famous video, the commission was testifying before Congress. And I'll show you the video now. Now remember, no one knew that this was coming. This is Feynman it's going to surprise Congress and the commission uh, right now. Well, I took this stuff that I got out of your seal and I put it in ice water. And I discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it maintains, it doesn't stretch back, it stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance for our problem. A simple yet effective demonstration. Now, as I said, neither the commission nor Congress had any idea if Biden was going to do that. They were just as surprised as everyone else. And of course, that was Feynman's intent. He was not to be silenced. So, and this is not usually the case, a clear and simple explanation emerged. The O-rings had failed just as Roger Boisgelet had predicted. But the huge fail was the inability of engineers to stop launches if they feel lives are in peril. NASA had estimated the risk of a shuttle accident as one in 100,000. Feynman ridiculed that estimate in a harshly worded critique of NASA written for the report, for the commission report. He estimated the risk at one in 100. The final tally, two shuttles lost in 135 flights. That's one in 68. Not very good odds. Rogers thought Feynman's critique would be too damaging to NASA and refused to include it in the commission's final report. Feynman sent an angry letter to Rogers, threatening to refuse to sign the report as a matter of conscience. Rogers backed down and agreed to include a toned-down version of Feynman's criticism as an appendix to the report, such as the reality of Washington. Feynman's critique ended with these words, which we should carry with us into our professional lives. For a successful technology, Reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Here's some takeaways from this disaster. Researchers at MIT did an in-depth study and found these salient points. There was a lack of problem reporting requirements. Misrepresentation of crit criticality is off by a, 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 hundred, a thousand times. Lack of adequate resources devoted to safety. Lack of safety personnel involved in important decisions and discussions. And finally, inadequate authority, responsibility, and independence of the safety organization. These deficiencies resulted in one of the most horrific accidents from not only the design engineer's view, but also the managerial and social relationships towards the space shuttle. As you can see, this was an enormously complex situation with many moving parts in which no one person was responsible. It was more like a systemic problem. It was the whole system that was responsible. And indeed, the space shuttle program was shut down for two and a half years to address these problems. To give you an idea on just how thorny ethical dilemmas can be, I, I would like to discuss a contemporary issue involving what technology is soon to deliver self-driving cars. 
But first, I want to introduce a concept that ethical philosophers have been grappling with for 2,500 years, because this sheds light on the issues involved in this case of self-driving cars. And this concept is the moral dilemma. Moral dilemmas cause us a lot of conflict due to contrasting moral imperatives. And remember, this is a dilemma. No solution exists as different values lead to different interpretations. And now by use of this example, uh, let's examine what a moral dilemma is. This particular moral dilemma is called the trolley problem and was introduced in 1967 by philosopher Philippa Foote. You are walking near a trolley track when you notice five people tied to it in a row. The next instant you see a riderless trolley hurtling towards them out of control. The five people will certainly be killed. A signal lever is in your reach. If you pull it, you can divert the train onto a spur track, saving the five, but killing another person who is tied to that side track. If you pull the lever by your action, you cause the death of a human being who would have lived had you not taken action. What do you do? Now, let's look at a different scenario first introduced by philosopher Judith Thompson in 1985. You're on a footbridge overlooking the track where five people are tied down and the trolley is rushing towards them. There's no spur this time, but near you on the bridge is a fat man. If you heave him over the side, he will fall on the track and his bulk will stop the trolley, but he will die in the process. What do you do? The calculus is the same as the previous problem. By your action, you can save five lives by sacrificing one life. Surveys suggest that up to 90% of us would throw the lever in spur, while a similar percentage think the fat man should not be thrown off the bridge. Yet, if asked, people find it hard to give logical reasons for this choice. Assaulting the fat man just feels wrong. Our instincts cry out against it. Now, here's an extra twist. What if the fat man is the one who tied the five people to the track. Would you push him then? There really is no right answer. We as scientists and engineers are comfortable with factual knowledge, right and wrong, yes or no. That is our home base. We tend to be much less comfortable uh, where there are huge gray areas. We need to learn how to think with nuance because we are really going to need it. And this is illustrated uh, by this next example of the self-driving car, which is really pressing uh, right now in 2022. Many car manufacturers are beginning to think about cars that take the driving out of your hands altogether. These cars are predicted to be safer and more fuel efficient than their manual counterparts. They also could relieve road congestion and minimize unproductive and stressful driving time. And that raises some difficult issues. I'd like to open up the floor to discussion about what these issues might be, any ideas? Remember the trolley problem when solving, uh, when answering this question. The question in my mind is how should the car be programmed to act in the event of an unavoidable accident? Here's the nature of the problem, which, as I said, is similar to the dilemma posed by the trolley problem. Now, you're in a self-driving car, this black one right here. Uh, on the freeway, you're following a truck. It's loaded with a bunch of crates. You're boxed in. On the right is a motorcycle. On the left is an SUV. The crates suddenly fall from the truck. Should the self-driving car swerve into the motorcycle to maximize your survival? Should it go straight and hit the crates to minimize harm to others but sacrifice your life? Or should it swerve left to hit the SUV, which has a high passenger safety rating, in the hope that no one will be killed? 
Now, if we were driving the car, whatever action we take would be considered as the reaction and not a deliberate decision with no forethought or malice. But in a self-driving car, this decision would have been made years earlier by programmers, companies, and policymakers. And now this begins to look like premeditated homicide. Enter the field of algorithmic morality. Should the self-driving car minimize the loss of life, even if it means sacrificing the occupants, or should it protect the occupants at all costs? Or maybe it should choose between these extremes at random. The answers to these ethical questions are important because they could have a big impact on the way self-driving cars are accepted in society. Who would buy a car programmed to sacrifice the owner? If fewer people buy self-driving cars because they are programmed to sacrifice the occupants, then more people are likely to die because ordinary cars are involved in so many more accidents. Public opinion will play a strong role and how or even whether self-driving cars become widely accepted. To this end, researchers at the School of Economics in France, they set out to discover the public's opinion using the new science of experimental ethics. They found that participants actually wished others to drive in autonomous vehicles that sacrificed the occupants more than they wanted to buy that same autonomous vehicle themselves. And therein lies the paradox. People are in favor of cars that sacrifice the occupant to save other lives, as long as they don't have to ride in one themselves. More questions arise. Should different decisions be made when children are on board, since they both have a longer life ahead of them than adults, and they had less agency in being in the car in the first place? Would hackers write an app that overrides the car's decision-making algorithms and make the car value the occupant's life over others? What about the program, the company, government liability? Can they be sued by the family of one killed by a self-driving car? These issues will be worked out in the coming years, and it will be fascinating to see how this plays out. We as engineers and scientists are really in an unfortunate situation because we are the ones who need to make these tough decisions. Previously, engineers did their job as best they could. Safety was, of course, paramount, especially in the last few decades. But they rarely had to solve moral dilemmas such as the one I just described in the example of the self-driving car. Well, I hope this lecture has given you some sense of the complexity of ethics and engineering. It is not only the urgency of thinking about these issues, but also a real need for nuanced thinking. In a field that deals primarily with facts and figures, where there are generally clear-cut right and wrong answers, nuanced thinking may not be our strong suit, but it's one we're going to have to grow into if we're to continue as a civilized society. Thank you for your time and attention. Are there any questions or discussion?